Here we get our people, yeah, yeah. 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 Best on our minister in Africa, yeah, yeah. yeah. Amanda! Yeah. Amanda! Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Most especially members of the press, both local and international media. We are here today because the Minister of Finance, the Honorable Samuel D. Tuer Jr., will be addressing a press conference. As you all are aware, two days ago, the Minister of Finance, along with two distinguished members of the legislature were placed on visa restriction by the United States government. The minister will address a press conference to respond to, respond to his name and that of his family being placed on visa restriction by the United States government. He thinks So, ladies and gentlemen, I'll present to you the <laughs> Minister of Finance, Honorable Samuel D. Tua Jr. Manna, you. Manna, 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 Yeah. 
No final minister can be compared to him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, me green and my God green. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, the press, distinguished fellow Liberians and patriots, under the sound of my voice in Radio Land, I have invited you here today to respond to the United States Department of State's imposition of visa restriction on me, Senator for Temporary, Senator Abel Tubachier. Senator Emmanuel Nukwe on November 11, 2023. In the morning of November 11, I received a FaceTime call from my 11-year-old daughter and first child, Sadel Datila Twe, who was in the sixth grade. She was calling to say she had won the writing competition she had started in November. She wrote a 12-chapter short story called The Emerald about twin sisters whose parents had died after giving birth and who went out to use a magical emerald to save their school and their world. It was the brightest morning I had seen in years. At age 11, I do not believe I had my daughter's imagination, and such achievement can keep dad smiling all day. I was having a really bright day. By seven in the evening, my wife showed me a text from my sister, Orito Pano, in the United States, describing what would eventually be a visa restriction imposed by the US State Department. The glow of my morning transformed into a glow of a pitch black evening. The propagandist, and malicious detractors who have sustained against me when I became Minister of Finance and Development Planning in 2018, a prolonged campaign of lies, misinformation, propaganda, and disinformation had finally succeeded. This was my initial reaction. I could only feel sorrow for my wife and darling little children. In a mere of the five word paragraph, the three individuals and their families were both summarily accused and rendered guilty without any due process of law. Their respective lifetime reputation summarily impaired by dint of misinformation and false allegations given to a powerful country. The allegation of verdict reads thus, pursuant to section 7031C of the Department of State Foreign Operations and Related Programs Appropriations Act 2023, the United States hereby publicly designate Twe, Chie, and Nukwe for their involvement in significant corruption by abusing their public positions through soliciting, accepting, and offering bribes to manipulate legislative processes and public funding, including legislative reporting and mining sector activity. As part of this action, the immediate family members are also designated, including their spouses, Delisha Barry Twe, Abigail Che and Ruthoria Brown Nukwe and Twe and Nukwe's minor children. The above verdict against us and our respective families is unbelievably unjust, unfair, and a fundamental violation of our rights. As a Minister of Finance and Development Planning, I have never abused my position through soliciting, quote, soliciting, accepting, and offering bribes to manipulate legislative processes and public funding, including legislative reporting and mining sector activities, unquote. I've never done so whether in dealings with the national legislature or in dealings with any other branches of government or institutions of government, of the government of my bureau, or with private sector actors. As minister, my job is to provide approved resources to the national legislature upon request and subject to the availability of cash. I've never influenced, quote unquote, legislative processes, whatever that implies. Specific reference to the mining sector confuses me, but I believe this reference pertains to my involvement 
to developing a multi-user gateway through the third-party amendment of ArcelorMittal's current concession and through granting real access to, it, to HPX High Power Explorations Incorporated, an American company owned by American billionaire Robert Freeland, looking to transport rail from Guinea to Liberia to the port of Buchanan. I say so because about a year ago in Washington, D.C., I received a hint that, the, that persons connected with the American company HBX were trying to get me on Treasury sanctions because I was allegedly and supposedly, quote, favoring Asla Metal Limited over HBX and preventing HBX from accessing the rail to conduct its investment in Guinea through Liberia, unquote. My informant knew this was unjust and unfair. Knowing the role I was playing on the Inner Ministerial Concessions Committee and understanding the difficulties and complexities of the negotiation, I was also informed that persons close to HBX were considering sanctions against me because the company had paid $37 million to the government of Liberia through the national budget since 2019 and was yet to have an agreement with the government. Legitimate monies received by the government of Liberia for the development of Liberia through the national budget is never a bribe. That an agreement has been difficult to reach because of complexity surrounding a pre-existing agreement is no reason to threaten government officials with sanction. I'm providing these explanations in context because there are chapters that have, these are the chapters that have underpinned threats of sanction against me and my family from powerful individuals. It is important for the public to understand and know these things. We have not discussed them publicly as a government, but now we have to discuss them under the current circumstances. I was advised that to avoid sanction, I should withdraw my support for Asala Mittal, Third Amendment, until after the election. It was on that basis that I advised the President, Dr. George Manawir, to turn over negotiations on the real to the United States government since too much propaganda and misinformation were threatening to destroy members of his cabinet. The president obliged, and the Americans for a brief moment tried to bring both HPX and Asala Mittal together to reach some understanding on the multi-user rail system. Meetings were held in London and Washington. Unfortunately, these meetings did not achieve anything, and the Americans withdrew and turned negotiations back to the government of Liberia. The truth of the matter is that Asala Mittal has an agreement with the government of Liberia signed by the United Party government that gives Mittal the right to use the Nimba rail to be the operator of this rail. In the government's vision to develop a multi-rail system, we have tried to have Asala Mittal relinquish operatorship of the rail to an independent third party rail operator for purposes of fairness and equity. Mittal has not been open to this position and we have been at a deadlock for more than three years. Realize the impossibility of having Mittal give up real operatorship and knowing the government was not willing to proceed to international arbitration, which is international uh, dispute adjudication or court, and knowing the government was also not willing to proceed to international arbitration, government moved to a position of having Mittal become the user operator in exchange for other critical rights Mittal would have to give up under its current concession that would enable fair and equitable access to third parties such as HBX. That would have enabled us to reach a compromise. Unfortunately, HBX does not seem open to such a compromise and has insisted that Mittal abandons the real operatorship. Mittal itself does not want to give up the real operatorship. As a consequence, Samuel Tua became the biggest victim in this power play between two billionaires, each of whom aims to undo the and outmaneuver the other. This is, the fundam this is fundamentally unfair to me and requires the correction by U.S. authorities. A few months prior to the 2023 elections, the IMCC paid a visit to the Port of Bicara. Prior to this visit, we had taken the position to press Asala Mittal harder to share the current facilities at the Port of Bicara with HPX to accept small shipments about two or one to two metric ton of old true gaining, preferably from HBX. Since under the current concession, Vital is obliged to share in both rail and port. I narrated, I narrated all of these positionings and repositionings 
to the Americans to prove that neither I nor other members of the government of Liberia were biased toward one investor against the other, but that we were bent on finding a practical solution to a very complex problem. Given legal concession rights Asalamita has under the current concession, forcing them out of operations of the rail would require litigation to courts or the armed forces of Liberia bursting through their premises, violating international law. Since the government did not prefer any of these two options, we only could concede to Mittal's operations in exchange for other rights for third-party companies like HBX. However, these explanations still evidently did not impress some higher-ups in Washington who have continued to use Africa intelligence, a propaganda media outfit, to rain attacks against the government of the CDC. The headline of the Af of African intelligence articles published on September 29, 2023, reads, quote, George Weir irks Washington and Robert Friedland. Uh, Robert Friedland is the billionaire owner of HBX, with mine transfers to Aslan Town. Several such false stories have been planted internationally and locally. As we leave government, we have left copious transition notes to guide a new administration on these complex and difficult issues. The latest thinking is to find a way for HBX to share the port of Buchanan for Asala Mittal to share the port of Buchanan with HPX, since it may take too long for HPX or other third parties to develop separate berth capacities at the Buchanan port. We wish the new administration luck in these negotiations and look forward to Liberia having fair and equitable multi-user rail system. I have related the above factual pieces of information to show that publicly available information on which individuals have been sanctioned or are being placed on visa restrictions are not reliable to use to destroy the lives of decent characters who have worked years to earn and build their reputation. This architecture of this information has been deployed to undo the CDC by powerfully connected persons. These public designations without any due process, without any investigation to which those who are accused are involved, where they have the chance to dispel rumors and counter misrepresentations or misinformation, do not represent the values and norms of the democratic, free-loving America I have admired since my youth. I will argue here publicly that these outcomes do not represent the stated foreign policy objectives as conceived and understood by Secretary of State Tony Anthony Blinken, Secretary of the Treasury Janet Yellen, and by President Joseph R. Biden. I know these outcomes are the work of powerfully placed officials or bureaucrats within the U.S. government who have deep connections and relations here in Liberia and who are sworn to and are committed to weakening the CDC. The recent designations are a mere strategy to disorganize the CDC while incoming government, while the incoming government struggles to find its bearing and to prevent a powerful, experienced, and knowledgeable CDC from mounting the fiercest political opposition. I will also observe that this is the fundamental unfairness to the conduct of foreign, in the conduct of foreign policy in the country and against the government that has shown nothing but commitment to the stated foreign policy objectives and interests of the United States. President Weir has advised his cabinet that the larger calculus of foreign policy considerations impinging on American interests, he stands with the American people. Liberia has sided with all resolutions against China, against Russia, and even when the rest of Africa took a different position. Most recently, in the United Nations resolution to end war in the, in the Gaza Strip, which would bring peace and end the killing and suffering of Palestinians, Liberia stood with America to say no to ending war. Despite this support, we still see the dismantling of the CDC. Yet we are made to believe that these designations are targeting individuals only. With the evidence at our disposal, we beg to disagree. The post-elections timing and character of recent designations are even more confusing and suspect. After President Weir elevated the Liberian democracy in his graceful concession to President-elect Joseph and Boaca, his government and party are being disintegrated by designations. In the Liberian Senate, either Senator Abbott Chie or Senator Emmanuel Nukwe stands today the strongest chance of being elected pro temporary of the Liberian Senate. CDC can claim at least 15 senators elect to make this happen, to conceivably eliminate them both and prevent the CDC from controlling both houses, since it is clear CDC will control the House of Representatives. It became necessary to use state department designations to summarily squash their chances. To do this, you have to add Samuel Twe, who had already been targeted in the Asala Mittal saga as we did it above. By doing this, you might strengthen the hand of the United Party to possibly control the Senate, 
while achieving the other important goal of decapitating a major intellectual linchpin of the CDC. So members of the press, fellow Liberians, members of the CDC have long been targeted. All of you here will bear eloquent testimony to the propaganda of the missing 16 billion, the lies of the so-called 25 million, and the attribution of so-called auditors debt to members of the CDC government. Even though the U.S. funded Crow report on the 16 billion have said there was no 16 billion missing, something I had publicly said on the radio months before the findings of the Crow report were released, and through a GAC report, and though a GAC audit report on the 25 billion have shown that I have had nothing to do with monies at the CBL, members of the opposition made sure this misinformation were kept on files in the United States. In a meeting with Democrat and U.S. Congressman Jim McGovern of the state of Massachusetts, in Washington, D.C. I was stunned by the level of detail in the misinformation given to U.S. congressional leaders against the CDC. The congressman told the Liberian delegation in the meeting, the President Weir proposed a 2020 national referendum because he wanted to serve for three, for three terms. When we clarified that this was not the case and that he had been misled by opposition surrogates, the congressman said, quote, you all got to be here in Washington every week to give us correct information because all the information we have about you guys is damaging, unquote. Wow. Similar things were echoed in several other meetings. It was clear to us that while we struggled to stabilize Liberia's difficult macroeconomic situation and fought the COVID-19 epidemic, the opposition was spouting propaganda garbage on the CDC government in Washington. By the time we had turned our gaze to Washington, significant damage had been done. Today, we are paying a costly price for this neglect. All the efforts to destroy the national image of the CDC ignore the massive progress the government has been making on governance, in the fight against corruption, and on, the transparency, on transparency in public finances. Under difficult circumstances, we raised the biggest slice of domestic revenue to date, increasing domestic revenue by 3% of GDP. We brought inflation down from 30% to a single digit in a year arguably the fastest inflation collapse in history. We regularized the backlog of government audits we inherited from the unit department. And more importantly, we ended disclaimers due to the lack of financial reporting that was the norm of the unit department. We stood up, to a, new, we stood up a new LACC where commissioners are beyond removal by any sitting president, setting the gold standard for independence. We braved the storm and reformed a broken and dysfunctional wage system without which our government would have collapsed. I double dare and challenge the incoming administration to reverse that reform and bring back waste and large pay gaps between government workers of the same qualification and experience. All these achievements have been confirmed separately in various reports by the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, and several other international organizations. Over the last two years of the MC, of MCC scorecards, the CDC administration has produced the best performance on the scorecard since 2007, when it started. President-elect Joseph Weicker, I believe, should have on his agenda engaging MCC on how Liberia can secure U.S. 500 million compact now that the government of President Weir has laid the groundworks for marked improvements in the range of governance areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yet after all these achievements, somehow, some at the State Department have never shown their profound appreciation of the gains we have made. The last ambassador sent here, Mr. Michael McCarty, became an effective opposition to the government of President Weir. In meetings at State and Treasury, I have copiously argued that there is a disconnect between how State and Treasury were gauging the performance of President Weir and the government and how other institutions were assessing our performance. Today, even after the President has graciously conceded, operators have determined to execute their plan. Destroy the CDC, uproot the grassroots mobilization capacity of the CDC, cripple the electoral center of the CDC by potentially destroying the careers of professionals like me through public misinformation and the threat to the U.S. government. None of these things was done to officials of the unit department. Whose Auditor General John Malou II once said, and I quote, Ellen Johnson Sullivan and Joseph Barker's unit department government three times more corrupt than the government of President Charles Miller, unquote. Sometimes in life, we have to face the dilemmas and the challenges of fundamental unfairness. These add to the strength of our character and to our resolve. 
No matter what, as we, we as respected persons and as political institutions, dub the CDC will and must prevail. As a father and a husband, I will fight injustice meted out to me and my family, irrespective of the might of the power of the individual or of the country inflicting that harm. I've always loved the United States and its ideals. I lived close to a decade as a resident of the United States and received graduate education there. America is truly a great country and a great democracy. However, in as much as I loved America, I did not become an American citizen. I have six children, one of whom was born in the United States. Now even this American child has been prevented from entering the U.S. because of this designation. My youngest daughter, Celicia Twer, is two years old, and I am 52 years old. In 10 years, she and I will be, in 10 years, she will be 12, and I will pray to be around to have an honest discussion about this designation, its fairness, and how she sees its impact on her life. But this is the world in which we live today. Power can be used to construct, and it can equally be used to destroy. In this digital information age, the age of social media where information moves faster to impact or to destroy, there is a role in the American value regime for corrective justice. In 1963, President John F. Kennedy's luminous inaugural lit the flame of the moral arc of American global leadership that had been exercised since the dawn of the 20th century. Kennedy said, and I quote, to those people in the huts and villages of half the globe struggling to break the bounds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. For whatever period is required, not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich." Unquote. Kennedy's admonition had been in full swing as the beacon of American altruism and will remain in full swing for the more than six decades since his death. No other country has borne the burden of history to right the grievous wrongs of the 20th century than the United States. America played a major role in the defeat of German Nazism and is the bedrock of the Bretton Woods international system, which is why the headquarters of the United Nations the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are located in the United States. America funded the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Germany. America has contributed the biggest aid to all of Africa and to the Third World in the last six decades since the demise of John F. Kennedy. America has usually helped the spread of Christianity and Christian values of love and forgiveness around the world. So yes, in many ways the United States has sterling claims to global competition, to the global competition for moral leadership. But the perverted use of American power by bureaucrats in the landscape of international diplomacy has led to rising anti-American sentiments around the world. Treasury and state designations have a critical role in changing behavior in Africa and around the world. Their misuse or their overuse can pose problems for America. Sanctions cannot and must not be used as a tool to destabilize a democracy such as Liberia or to weaken an opposition. Seven persons receiving designation in the space of three years from largely one side of the political divide in a country that is both a democratic and has more recently become a macroeconomic exception in West Africa, mm -hmm. should tell us, should tell U.S. cabinet secretaries, U.S. congressional leaders, and U.S. presidents that something is a foul that requires a holistic review. I hope in fighting to overturn the injustice that has been meted out to me and my family, I can contribute immensely to, to perfecting the use of American power for the greatest good of the world and of humanity. I thank you.